Hey, Raindrops. Yes, I am going on tour. Reality with the King tour is coming to a city near you. We are kicking things off in New Jersey with the queen of Jersey, baby, Teresa Judice, on Saturday, April 13th at the White Eagle. On Monday, April 22nd, I am doing a live Messy Mondays with the one, the only, Tamar Braxton in Atlanta at City Winery. On Thursday, April 25th, I am going to California, the OC baby, with a very special guest, Teddy Mellicamp at Irvine Improv. That is, again, Thursday, April 25th. For all my mothers, darling, yes, on Mother's Day, I am celebrating all the mothers. Come party with the king, honey, and the cast of Love and Marriage DC. Just the women, though. Mm-hmm-hmm. Ashley, Irena, Winter, and Joy, we're all going to celebrate Mother's Day together on a big Mother's Day brunch. That is Sunday, May 12th in D.C. at the very prestigious Howard Theater. To get your tickets, look down the link below, okay? Buy your tickets, and I will see you soon. Raindrops, on today's episode of Reality with the King, no, you are not seeing double. Okay, I know we look alike. I know we have the same <laughs> biceps and the same. <laughs> oh, man. Give it up for the man who will forever be considered as the hottest husband that Bravo has ever seen. Apollo Nida. Indeed, indeed, indeed. How you been? It's been years, years. since I've seen you. Years. You look great. You do too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I I'm trying to like you know, make sure that I keep the same level of workout ethic that you taught me while we were working together. Definitely. Because you, you taught me how to work out. It's hard. But you was looking good for, for a minute. I was like, damn, he's catching up to me. I got to take it up another notch. You said for a minute. For a did, minute. Did I slip off? You did a little bit. I did. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Apollo, I got, hold on. No, no, look, <laughs> hold on one second, Apollo. I definitely think I have been... You still got your arms? Yes. Okay. Wait. I thought you fell off. Okay, okay. Okay, got you. Yeah, no. I thought, I, yeah it's cool. It's cool? Uh, yeah, I thought you fell off, man. No, no, no. Okay, it's just this shirt. It was just the the, 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 the fitted the fitted uh, uh, a sweater. Okay. That's all. Okay. Cardigan. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's nice. So though. I'm good. You're good. You approve. Yes. Because we need the workout video. Most definitely. You know, I don't know if you still have the booty DVDs yep. that you and Phaedra were doing. We still have them. You still have them? They're still in the marketplace, actually. Are you selling them in the back of your trunk? No, they're still on Amazon, actually. They are? Yeah, they're still on Amazon, but I think... Uh, so I bought out the uh, distribution and fulfillment a long time ago. Um, there was uh, issues with that. It's like... Uh, so I think once it uh, once the press came out that we beat out... Kim Kardashian, uh, Billy Blanks, Bob Harper, Julian Michael, Jane Fonda. We we had top sales in the nation. And uh, the revenue wasn't really matching up with the credibility of the accolades that we've accomplished. Yeah. So at that time, <clears throat> I was like, okay, well, you get a check that comes in for, I think, like 47000 right, for one month sales. Mm. Then it went to somewhere trickled down to like maybe, I think the low within the four months was like seventy two k, right? Then how do you jump from 72 down to like 24? This is like in a six, seven month period. And then I'm like, okay, well, something's not right. So then when you start looking back at the production and looking back at, you know, the, the, the company who was running everything, there was no ledger. We're not seeing any type of invoices. We're not seeing, uh, you know, the DVD sold. All it is is, oh, you need to have, uh, I think it was 25 of each, uh, 2,500 of each volume. So volume one, volume two. So 5,000 mm -hmm. copies in queue at all times per month, right? And back then, you know, it wasn't ubiquitous like now as far as the media and, and being able to shoot something for a fraction of the cost. Now, remember when you came and did the Fine um, fine Baby, the, yes, the, uh, the prenatal yeah. video, right? Uh-huh, I remember that. So when you did the prenatal video, that was a fraction of the cost of what, we spent 125K, yeah. On a freaking production. It's unheard of. There's yeah. no way, you know? But you live and learn, right? Mm -hmm. So the low the low hit to around like 11 k a check came in for 11000 right? We're still doing the promotion. We're still doing everything. I'm like, this is not right. 
So look, I need to do a cease and desist. We need to go ahead and just stop everything. Our attorney at the time was like, listen, you signed like a five, no, 36 month contract with them. I was like, yeah, but there's a clause in there. You know, if you're unhappy, you you know, we need to breach this contract. So, you know, me back then, I was a little more rough around the edges. So I just showed up and paid them a visit at the studio. You and, and the guns. Yeah, basically. Your, your, your biceps. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Not those guns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. those guns. Yeah. <laughs> the biceps. Be clear. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, we talked about it and they were just telling me, oh, you know, basically trying to lure me back in. And stated that, you know, it's going to be a difficult run for you. You're new in this business. You're going to get a lot of individuals who are unhappy with the product. And, you know, you got to really think about the back end as far as uh, support, the support. Mm -hmm. But support, dude, you got to email on here. You know, no one's calling, answering the phone. So I was like, you know what? I don't care. Just give me my shit. Just give it everything back. Ship everything back to me. So that took a minute. Uh, then I went to his partner. Uh, Bravo was actually shooting that uh, show. Uh, I think it was called Tone It Up with the Tone It Up girls. Something the, like that, yeah. Just, yeah, the two girls or whatnot. Uh -huh. So they were shooting in uh, L.A. So I had to go back out there. And then I popped up on the production out there with the guy, the the, the partner. Yes. I don't want to mention no names or anything like that. But um, he was like, listen, okay, cool. You want out? Cool. We'll send everything back. So once I got everything back, the next thing you know, the sales started going back up. And then we were able to see everything. But the problem is... That network, let's just say if you're selling, you know, eighty some thousand dollars worth of product, you still have you still have um, the individuals who actually purchased your product and you could remarket. So they're taking my market, my, my uh, customers and they're remarketing other products to those customers. So it's like, you know, it was a big shit show. Mm -hmm. But anyways, um, so now, yeah, the product's still in the marketplace. But the thing is, I need to make it digital now because nobody does DVDs yeah, and all be that good. stuff. Do that. So, so go back digital. But I, I have uh, basically, I've written up like content for, because, you know, I was the, the uh, producer. I, you know, I wrote and produced everything. So the whole curriculum behind it, I did seven new layouts since I was away. I just haven't filmed any of it. So a couple of them come with like different apparatuses. Uh, you know, there's, um, th you know, different platforms, different tiers. So I've done that. It's just being in that right space because since I've been home, I've been grinding, man, just really trying to get traction. Because like you said, um, to your point earlier was there's people who come home being in deprivated state and they mm. really can't catch traction mm -hmm. and they're really just slopping mud up it's like you know it's just slick tires you know and so i haven't really had an opportunity to really just put everything into motion and i have so many ideas there's so much you know so many things that i did with my time with my spare time when i was gone that i need to put into you know production and put into play so since you you've been home for for how long back in atlanta so i i got out and um came home in may of 19 um, and they had me on a house arrest program. So it's a six month program. So technically, um, but I was still at home. So I came back to Atlanta. I came to visit uh, Thanksgiving of, of Thanksgiving of 19. And I moved here. No, I came to visit during COVID because they shut Philadelphia all the way down. So they said Atlanta's open. Oh, I'm going to come back here for so a while. So you were stationed in Philly. Correct. Okay. Then we permanently moved back to Atlanta, I want to say, October of 2020 mm. is when we came back permanently. Um, and since then, you know, we decided to get into the real estate. Shireen, you know, she has her license. She's a broker. She does designs, uh, you know, all of that stuff from the architectural standpoint. And most agents, you know, they're, they're, their feet are, you know, the, the biggest accomplishment for an agent is, hey, I want to be an investor. Mm -hmm. or, or, and, or you want to be, you know, have your own brokerage. So it's one of the two, you know, so... She decided to get out of the 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 handover, you know, fit situation every day going out, marketing yourself, meeting with a gazillion clients just to sell a house. So she said, Hey, let's just start building our own. Let's start designing our own homes and things like that. So I already had a team from, you know, back when you saw I did the house in uh, Buckhead. Yeah. Um, I already had my same crew and then some of the properties that we've had, they would service some of the things when I was away and stuff like that. So I've always kept my same team. So we've just kind of expanded since then from as far as heavy machinery. Everything's in-house. And I kind of just took the, the street mentality, if you will, the entrepreneurial side, if you will, and just cut out the middleman. Because when you have a contractor that comes on, the contractor, what they normally do is they sub it out. So you're going to have four contractors. They're sub, sub, subbing. So, you know, in, in the street terminology, it's like if you have a product, per se, mm -hmm. and then you stretch that product, 
right? You're just stepping on that product and you and by the time you get to the end, it's like either garbage and or you didn't paid, you know, a markup on the retail, which you really don't have to. So I decided to go directly to the trade and, and then in lieu sign the trademen straight to us. And then they work for us exclusively. And so therefore we're just getting, our prices are pretty much unmatched. No, you're doing good. You're doing good. And I'm so proud of you because obviously <clears throat> we met each other on season three of the Real Housewives of Atlanta. Yep. When you decided to do the show, when your then wife Phaedra tells you that she's been approached to do a reality show, what were your first thoughts? Um, I really was like, no way. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to do it because, um, <clears throat> again, uh, well, it's, it's no secret now, but I was in the streets, you know, mm. pretty, pretty heavily in the streets. And um, I really didn't want that. Uh, I didn't want that, you know, attention. But then I was like, OK, it could be a good thing, too. Right. So it served to be a good thing, because if you think about it, when all of the wives were saying, you know, oh, she takes care of him and, 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 um, and, and uh, you know, she buys this and she does that. That was great for me. That's why I never said nothing, because, OK, keep thinking that. Right. Well, I just keep stacking my money. We just keep living our lives. It doesn't really matter because that's what your perception is reality. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what I'm doing back here. So it kind of helped mask a lot of things, too, you know. Oh, so it helped keep what you were doing in the streets, in the yeah, streets. Exactly. <clears throat> and not having to explain. Because one thing Phaedra did say when the girls were asked, like, what does Apollo do? And she would say something like, you were the repo man. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> and we were all like, no, so is um, Apollo the repo man, Phaedra? No, no, no. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> no. So, okay. The thing about it is like uh, it's uh, asset recovery. When she, yes, asset recovery. Yeah, she yes. can consi she considered a repo man, but it's so funny that you mentioned that, right? Because she just calls me about a case, literally uh, last month, maybe about a month ago. She calls me. We, we talk all the time, especially when it comes like to legal matters or you know just certain things that she knows that I handle a lot of things, whatever. So she called and was like, "Hey, you remember you was doing the, you had this business, blah blah blah, back when this case just came across my desk." I said, "You idiot." I said, you don't remember? I was like, I told you to get into that business a long time ago. I said, here it is like 20 years later and now. And she was like, yeah, so what's going on with it? But anyways, yeah. So what it is, is, you know, individuals out here, they have, um, there's like right now it teetered up. It used to be like one point something billion. But right now it's like three something billion dollars just in the state of Georgia that's held at the Department of Revenue. And a lot of people don't know about this. OK, so it could be as small as two, one cent all the way to, you know, Millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. It just depends. You, you can pick through the litter and figure out which, you know, which claim you want to go after and who you want to patronize in order to represent them. Plus, the laws have changed a lot. But just getting to the to the meat of it is that let's just say you for for, for easy sake, let's just say uh, T-Mobile. Mm -hmm. Let's just say you paid your T-Mobile bill and you decided to go to Sprint. Right. And your, your bill was uh, five hundred dollars. OK. And you have a rebate, let's just say of two hundred and fifty dollars. Well, that two hundred and fifty was supposed to be mailed back to you. OK. You don't get it. Well, they can't hold on to it. So that money has to then be forfeited over to the Department of Revenue, mm -hmm. Georgia Department of Revenue. Every state has a Department of Revenue. The money gets forfeited to the Department of Revenue. You don't know about it. It just sits there. So it goes into what's called a coffer. OK, it goes into a, a, like an escheat program. And so then once it gets into that escheat program, it's forfeited in the state of Georgia It's forfeited after six years. And here it is. It's not just don't look at the small part is two hundred fifty dollars. No, there is millions of millions of dollars mm -hmm. out there. We're not talking about collecting, we're talking about just one claim itself, you know? So it varies. It goes from insurance to trust to bonds, stocks, you know, uh, uh, annuities, dividends. It's it's all across the board, not just with the T-Mobile thing. And so- So you were doing that at the time? Yes. And yes. so is it, so the money you would, would you take the money and figure out how to distribute it or how, how were you able to recover that asset? So this is the thing. Um, I, I, so my case actually, there's two parts. So my legitimate business, I had legitimate business and I just basically mirrored the legitimate business with the illegal side of it. And I was doing it illegally because the people didn't know. So I was just basically still taking the funds when they didn't even know while well, I was taking the funds from the, from the state mm -hmm. per se. The feds never, you know, they know that my, my business was legitimate, so they never did anything with my legitimate business. I just transferred everything, shut everything down, hands up, hey, I'm guilty, whatever. Let's just deal with this illegal 
um, matter over here. So once you find the person and you locate the individual, of course, there's, you know, software and all that stuff. Once you contact the person, of course, you'll put them in the contract. Mm -hmm. Things have changed a lot since back when. The laws have changed. They make it extremely hard because based on, like, my crime, they don't want people to do that. Because back then it was very easy. Nowadays, you know, you they want you to be backed by an attorney and or, you know, if you're that person, your paperwork has to be spot on. Mm -hmm. You know, it can't just be no foolery. So... <clears throat> Once you find the individual, you lock them in the contract. Then back when you used to could go up to something like almost you could charge amount as a, a, a PI attorney, which personal injury, that's what that stands for. You could do something like 33 percent in the state of Georgia. Well, as a finder's fee, you're only able to uh, through the Treasury, you're only able to do 10 percent, a third party finder's fee. So. You're not really that's you know, you got to do a hell of a lot of claims. Mm -hmm you know, at 10% to, to make money, you know, which, you know, it can still be feasible, but you have to have your network put in place so that, you know, because it's almost like, for example, um, if you get into a personal injury per se, right, and you go to your doctors and you got, you know, your chiropractor, you got your medical and all this, you might get a stipend, you might get a check for 50K, but when it comes down to you, that check, you know, it gets trickled down. You got to pay your medical, you got to pay the doctors, you got to pay whoever, and then your attorney costs. So of course, the, depending on how you set your network up, per se, then you can still make money mm -hmm. because you still have fees associated with this claim. You still got to find the person. You got footwork. You got research. It's still a lot that can go into it if you wanted to carve it out and make that a business. But uh, in, in, in a sense, no, I wasn't like repoing cars. You know, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a little deeper than that. Uh, just a lot of people really didn't understand the business. And then, of course, like the housewives, you know, everybody don't want to listen to anything. So it's kind of like, Whatever. You know what? You girls are and the men too, hey, you guys are fixated on what fixated on what what you think is whatever. So hey, take it, run with it. I don't care. Well no, what they listened to though was <laughs> Phaedra's due date changing all the time, right? Yeah. Um is one of the reasons why the due date change is because you two got pregnant before you were married. Um, let's count that up. May, uh, let's see. Yeah, possibly like a, maybe, a, uh, maybe about a month before. So she got pregnant a month before yeah. you said I do. What was, was the due date controversy? Not before the, uh, excuse me, not before the proposal though. You know, you proposed before. Yeah. Yeah. So this was the thing, right? Go ahead. So I, so because that's the biggest mystery is she lied about her due date because no. she was having a baby out of wedlock. No. So this is the thing. Phaedra and I have known each other or been uh, together, friends or whatever, you know, since 1997. It's a very long time. Um, and you were how old? Um, 19. And she was how old? Uh, 24. Okay. 25. But I lied about my age. She was 25. She just graduated law school. Okay, so you're okay. 19, she's 25. Yes. But you told her you were? I think it's like 22 or something like okay. that. But see, the thing about it was the the opulence, like the cars that I had, the jewelry and stuff like back then, because I've always been pretty, you know, pretty, uh, what's a good term for it? I've been um, uh, pretty well off, mm -hmm. if you will, um, for, for quite some time, um, despite, you know, me, you know, going to prison and all that type of thing. But, and y'all um, met on the freeway. On the freeway, on the freeway. So we're driving. I seen this pretty little thing. You know, I start flirting. But we were, man, when I tell you, it was bumper to bumper traffic on 285 going across the Chattahoochee Bridge right there before you merge on the 75. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and so I start messing with it. I was like, hell, we're in traffic. There's nothing else to do. So I start <laughs> like kind of flirting. <clears throat> and then she's not really trying to hear it. But then finally, I mean, we're literally in traffic for a while. So what else are you going to do? Right. So then finally she kind of gives in because I really don't. I'm, I'm relentless. I don't stop. Right. So we go. Merging on the 75, and then I'm like, okay, we're getting, we passed, uh, what's that, Windy Hill, and we're heading towards the next exit, Delk Road. I said, you know what? Man, this woman might think I'm a creep or something. You know, I don't want to just, like, I'm following her, but I'm literally going to the barbershop because we opened up a shop out there in Powder Springs. So I was like, okay, let me get in front of her. So I get in front of her, and I go get off Delk, and we have to go way down Delk Road to this little side street called, like, Sandtown. Nobody knows First of all, I'm glad I did get in front of her because if I would have turned off this little road that she was turning on, oh, she would have definitely thought like this guy's like mm -hmm. up to no good, you know? So I turn and then when we turn on this little road, she honks the horn and pulls over and comes on the side and was like, follow me. I'm like, follow you. Okay. 
I'm getting into some things in my time, right? So I'm like, okay. So we go, we go to her house. She stayed right down the street. Hold on, brother. <laughs> day one. Day one. Day no, not even day. No, not day. Well, you know, no, hours like, like like not forty five minutes, minutes later. later yeah. So Phaedra <clears throat> says to you, "Come to my crib." Yeah. Okay. Yeah, she says, "Follow me." Mm -hmm. So I follow her. We pull up at the house in the driveway. I get out. I see her. She looks at me. Hey, blah, blah, blah. We talk for a minute. Out, so, what, did you, you talked outside the outside house? Outside the house, yeah. Outside okay. in, the, in the driveway. Okay. In the driveway. She was like, what are you doing over here? You know, I said, oh, well, the barbershop's down the street. She's like, oh, you cut hair. I said, yeah, I cut hair at the shop. She's like, oh, wow, okay. Because they built a new plaza and everything mm -hmm. down there. She knew where it was at. All right, cool. Let's stay in contact. And then from there, we just, you know, I, I think I called her a couple of times because back then you didn't really didn't have the cell phones like that or you did, but they were expensive, you know. And uh, so the home phone, called the home phone a couple of times. She didn't answer, left a couple of messages. She was in uh, Barbados or something, Galapagos. Island. She was somewhere. But um, she returned my call finally like a month later. And she was like, hey, I've just been traveling, but I'm home now. You want to hook up? So we went out to eat. We went to Applebee's. We went to Applebee's. Not, they, you know what's crazy? Not the two for 20. The Applebee's is still there right there on uh, on uh, by the Galleria. Yes. It's still there. The same. Yeah, we went there. Oh, we went it there. was not a, an expensive day at all. No. So, you went, so we two went for to 20. The, yeah, we went to the movies too. I think we went to the movies, yeah. Oh, and, a, um, a $10 movie ticket. Yeah. So, okay. you know, it was great. I wish we could do that back now, <laughs> then now right? If you could get away with that now, oh, man, it would be great. <laughs> oh, man. Think about it. We could go. Think, you think about it. When you're with your friends, right? And the bill comes. And just like for you guys, and the bill is like 150 bucks. You're like, whoa, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, so you you pay the whole thing, right? <laughs> but man, things are so expensive nowadays. It's crazy. But yeah, we um we go out to eat, and uh, so that's kind of how we started our relationship, uh, just being friends and just going from there. And uh, so to that point, so when I came home, uh, there was a situation that occurred. You know, most people don't know, but. Uh, so when I got arrested the first time, you know, that whole situation, uh, a lot of people might say, like, th this this here, no one even knows this. You know, this is the first time I've even made this statement ever. So I go do six years on a RICO case. The same thing that, like, Thug is under whatever for racketeering, uh, a corrupt organization act. This is when you were the very first, first started dating Phaedra. Yes. Okay. Yes. So. It's almost like if you have <clears throat> and my thing wasn't gang related, it's more so like a. Uh, uh, a white collar uh, offenses, mm -hmm. right? But on a high scale. So here it is. You have multiple crews out there. You have people that, I mean, you know, you're not just one person that's doing white collar crime. There's probably a gazillion people, right? So long story short, someone that I know was committing these crimes, right? And they, we were very close at the time and they utilized some information I had got arrested for something for a very short stint of time. And I called Phaedra to come and assist with that for the bond and everything. She was like, well, you're going to get a bond, but you probably have to sit like 45 days. All right, no problem. All right, but don't worry about it. You're going to get a bail. So I think she came to visit me. Uh, so during that time as like putting our case together to get the bond, we went to court a couple times. So let's say on the second or third time going to court, when we're back at the jail, she comes and pays me a visit and says, hey, well, no, this is at the courthouse. She says, I don't know what's going on, but the feds is outside and they're saying that, you know, they're wanting you for this, that and the third. I'm like, there's no way. Like, I'm literally in here for just this situation that's really we're going to get through this because I'm not guilty for what I'm in there for. But I said, okay, okay, we'll just cross that bridge later, but it's not me. Again, um, we won't use the word framed, but I basically, uh, I knew exactly what happened. I knew that I knew exactly how everything went down. And, uh, I found myself in a, in a conundrum. I found myself mm -hmm. in a, in a bad spot and I wasn't going to flip on my friends or anything like that. I found myself in a really, really dark place. And, uh, here it is. I'm going to trial. I'm being extradited to uh, to uh, South Georgia, where I've never been. OK, never been out there, never done a crime out there. So we fight. It was a 16 count indictment. OK, I was only on one count, which was count one, which is the RICO. Well, in order to have a RICO, you have to prove like predicate acts is what it is. You have to show how you're tied to this, uh, you know, to this mm -hmm. organization. But again, I'm, they got me tied to an organization, but then they have me as the ringleader of the organization, right? Mm -hmm. Well, 
all of the elements really didn't add up. So we did like a um, improper venue, no jurisdiction, all this crap. But long story short, I wound up doing this time. I did six years on that for something that I didn't do. I wrote it out. So fuck it, went to trial, I lost trial. I was lo Pedro your attorney? Yeah, at first she was, but then I was like, okay, you know what? We kind of had a little falling out and there's a lot of respect for her too. And I'm going to get to that point um, that I do have. That's like I said, I've never really mentioned this, you know, mm -hmm. it's all in the past, but there's a lot of respect for her that I do give for just, I guess we would say like keeping the code, but at least just like staying loyal, staying, staying, staying loyal and above board. So, um, I decided to get another attorney who was like a RICO professor. He wrote a couple books. I thought that that might fit the bill better because this is the first time that she would try a big case like this. Plus, it's a black woman, mm -hmm. you know, down in the country. You, you don't know what happened. So I'm just looking at everything in totality. Plus, it's my life, you know. Mm -hmm. And we had a couple little little quarrels about that. You know, uh, I don't think that's the best move for you. You know, who's going to have your back? Who's going to talk? You know, at the end of the day, I still I rolled the dice and, uh, you know, I crapped out you know, versus hitting my number. But mm -hmm. um, there was a, one of my co-defendants who testified against me, like, I'm going to trial, and then motherfuckers is taking the stand, okay? And, I mean, whole diagram, board, and everything. I mean, it, it, it got rough. And so he hired her to be his counsel. He hired Phaedra yes. to be his counsel. Yeah, and uh, so guess what that would mean? That would mean she would have to sit there cross-examine, and she would have to then blast me or knock my head off, right? So she was the opposing... Yeah. So my co-defendant, who was a co-defendant, she was hired to be his representation. So Phaedra had to yeah. go against you in the court of law. Yeah, so what she did was she just resigned from the case. Oh, she recused herself. Recused herself, yes. She recused her, recused herself. Ah. And, um, and so she, that's why for you that was very upstanding. Yes, very, very. And I said, you know what? I get it. You, you prefer just to have hands off and not even get in that muddy water, you know? That was good. Yeah, and that so, was great. And so, you know, she went her way. Uh, I went my way. She was, you know, disgruntled about me, you know, hiring another counsel and so forth. And... Here we go. I go down in the books <laughs> and I wind up losing trial. And so they gave me the time. And it wasn't until I had another friend who's uh, so they messed all my paperwork up with my appeal. It was real just shitty. So I had another friend who had an, whose uh, cousin was an attorney and I was I was cool with her father. It's her father's sister. Well, sorry, it's her aunt. Sorry. So I was cool with her dad and the way me and her their dad is a, a, a neurosurgeon up in um in. Uh, Indiana. Mm -hmm. So I was really cool with them. I gave her dad a couple good pointers. So when um, XM Radio was a Cyrus, uh, Cyrus or Sirius, Sirius. Sirius Radio. Uh -huh. So when they first came out and the IPO came out, this is like 2000, 2001, the IPO was extremely low. And me and her dad used to talk about stocks and so forth. And I was like, hey, you might want to jump on this. And he was like, you sure? I said, man, I really think so. You should jump on this. He made a shitload of money, a shitload of money. And so her dad always talks to me. He's like, hey, if, if, if you ever need anything, let me know. I owe you. Oh, you want. So I, I needed it. So I reached out to my friend. I was like, hey, look, this is where I'm at. She used to come see me. She was like, you know what? My cousin is a practicing attorney in Atlanta. I want to talk to my, I met my aunt. She said, I'm going to talk to my dad and see what he can. I said, yes, talk to your dad. So sure enough, she came to see me and I had one last chance and it was uh, basically a habeas corpus. Uh, I can't remember. So we filed this habeas. Basically it was like a, uh, false imprisonment type thing, just mm -hmm. saying that I'm being held against my will and we just filed that against the prison. It gave me one last chance to go back before the courts. Anyways, I wind up, by that time, the feds dropped the case. GBI wound up picking it up during that time. I think I left that part out. And so I'm basically in the state. In the state of Georgia, you do a third of your sentence. So uh, they wind up giving me, um, on a state level, it was like 18 years when I lost trial. 18 years. You got sentenced for 18 years. Yep. And on on the nonviolent offense, the thing about it is on a RICO, the, the RICO in the state of Georgia, well, mostly like in the nation, is the highest statute of crime because, you know, it entails whatever, murder, extortion, mm -hmm. blah, 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 right? So all this stuff. And um, they, considering it was nonviolent and it, it fell in the line of the RICO, there's still like it's the, it's a level seven. 
So it goes outside the grid. So level six is where it teeters at. But it's like a level seven. So what they did, they just treated it as the same as it was a level six and consider it was nonviolent and you do a third of your time. So three times six is 18 mm -hmm. and that will be the third. So I didn't know that. So the whole time I'm sitting, not really sure what's going to happen, but I'm still fighting to get out. And mind you, I'm in there this whole time wrongfully convicted. I didn't do it. Now, there was some elements, right? We, I, My whole defense was, we're not saying, hey, I never committed a crime. That was not the defense. Yeah, yeah. The defense was, I'm not part of this. Right. Right. We're not saying that I wasn't doing something, right, or out, out there, but I just wasn't a part of that. But anyways, so when I came home, her and I, uh, and again, like I say, nobody ever knew that. So here it is, this story that's being told even on the, on the Housewives, mm -hmm. and I was, oh, this man's a crook. And it, guess what? It's not even worth it. It's not even worth it. What, what am I going to do? Wave the flag and say, oh, I didn't do it and try to tell everybody and, and plead my case. Right. Well, guess what? The damage is done. I'm still a convicted felon. I still went to jail. I still did time. But I went to time. I, I did time, but I didn't do it. Literally, I didn't do it. Had nothing to do with it. So um, anyways, get out. I said, you know what? We, we stayed in contact. Uh, I think I called her a couple times. I think I uh, reached out to her when I lost trial just to say hello. Then um, I went to a camp uh, in Atlanta. Um, I think I was in Griffin, Griffin, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to her over the phone, reached out to Phaedra over the phone. And she was just like, you know, how long do you have to go? I was like, I don't know. But come to find out I was at the camp, my level of crime, I wasn't supposed to be there. And that kind of, I don't know how I got there, but I stayed there. It was short lived. And then I wound up going to another prison. And that's when um, things started kind of rolling for me a little better. And um, I wound up getting out. And when I got out, <clears throat> um, I called her and she was like, oh, when are you coming home? I was like, I'm home. She's like, oh, you're home. Really? And then, you know, she was already like engaged to somebody. And um, uh, at that point, I was just like, man, you know, I think there might still be something, you know. So then I pursued it. And we kind of pursued Phaedra, although she was engaged. To another man? Well, I just felt like it was still mine, you know, at the time. You know, I really felt that way. And um, I went over to her house and we just started talking and kind of picked up from there. And she knew my circumstances at mm -hmm. that time. Like she knew, you know, I was staying with a friend of mine, just got out. And again, you know, that was supportive too. I think a lot of things change. Like when you're, um, as you know, these, when you're on TV and you get your celebrity and all that stuff, you know, you, you become a different person. Think about it. Even you're not the same person you were. I'm sure people tell you, oh, you've changed. Of course, yeah. You know, but you have to change to some degree. For sure, you grow. You yeah, grow. Yeah. Absolutely. But the, the character of who you are should remain the same. It should. It should. It should. It yeah, should. yeah. Absolutely. So, like, um, just fast forward, like, when I came, when, when, when everyone was filming at the house prior to me, the very last time I was on TV, yeah. um, when I came to the house... And I was disgruntled about all that stuff. It's because no one really knew the backstory, right? No one knew that this woman's been gone for quite a couple of days with the kids and I had to yeah. fight to see my kids. And I'm coming home really to handle my business at the house, not to see a filming crew. And like you ever seen when they jump on the uh, Wizard of Oz, the witch is dead, the witch is, and then uh -huh. it's like you're sitting here having a whole party, you know, when I'm gone. So <clears throat> that's why, you know, I was really upset then, but just uh, rewinding a little bit when um, as we started going, she was really, you know, supportive about that fact. And then she was like, hey, let's not you. We're going to keep playing around. What are we going to do? We've known each other forever. You've had your ups and downs. I've had my ups and downs. You've been here at my low times. I've been I've been there for you. So we're not going to cross each other. Right. Clearly, that's been shown. We're not going to cross each other. That's before TV and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You trust me. I trust you. Right. Right. OK, cool. You think we should do this and start a family? Okay, cool. You think so? Yeah, let's do it. Well, okay, what about all this other stuff though that comes with that? Like rings and this. You you live an opulent lifestyle. You know, you're 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 an astute person. So what what do you want me to do here? Cause I'm not ready, ready to, you know what I'm saying, to stop what I'm doing. I'm over here. My buddy gave me his condo, has a two-bedroom condo. He didn't even ask me for anything. Matter of fact, he was encouraging me to just take my time. And he used to put Everything is paid for. I'm talking about every week there's groceries in the refrigerator. There's money on the counter. Like everything is everything. Like, listen, Paulo, don't trip out. Don't do nothing. Just get yourself together. So then when I was telling her this, she was like, well, you do know that when people get married, 
there's responsibility. And you guys said, well, how about this? We can get married and I'll just live over there for a couple more months. And then it was like November 1st is when we got married. Mm-hmm. I can move in some months later. It might sound weird, but it's all about what you talk to with your person, you know, and what your you and your partner comes into an agreement with. But that didn't fare with her. So she's like, no, nah, that ain't going to work. Okay, well, why don't you just take care of the smaller things and then I'll worry about the bigger things, the mortgage and all this stuff. I didn't feel right stepping into a fucking $3,000 mortgage. Like, dude, I just came home. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, so how soon did she get pregnant after you got home? Man. I don't know, man. We was pound town in. I mean, <laughs> you, know you had to make up for lost time. <laughs> yeah. So no I conjugal think, visits? No, none of that. They don't they stopped all that. Okay. Ago. Yeah, you don't have So you come that. home and then Yeah, yeah. But the thing is we really didn't think that I didn't because we've always had like, you know, I guess the unprotected situation, you know, and nothing's ever happened. And then all of a sudden I guess we really Your pull out game was good back then. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Is it good now, Apollo? I mean, I'm not. I mean, I'm married right now. So I'm not. You know what I'm saying? You got. You got to. You got to put uh, yeah, birth, birth control and all that good stuff. You know. But um. Uh, so you think this whole confusion with the due date had a little bit to do with the fact that, listen, she comes from being a pastor's kid. And she's she's also private. We know that. I think it's the privacy. I don't think that she thought, I don't think that she really thought that through, thought that question through. It just right. hit her. And then she was like, okay, well, what are my parents going to think? Or yeah. this, that. Maybe it just hit her. And then, you know, some people just say things. Mm-hmm. And then it's kind of too late. And that's what I spoke to her about, you know, prior to going on to the uh, married to medicine and all that situation, right? Because I was like, why do you, you said something. Because literally I called her and I was like, this is why, one of the reasons why I really don't want to go on here, right? I don't mind, but I don't want to. Why do you dig a hole for yourself? Is it when she told people y'all met in high school? No, it's like she said something about um, the reason why I wasn't at uh, Aiden's. Aiden's birthday is because I was out of town. Dude, why didn't you just tell the truth and say we've had multiple birthday parties? That was for the TV. That was for you guys. Yeah. That was a, Like, what are you doing? But see, when you do that, then it causes more scrutiny. It causes for people to say, hmm, well, how is that? When I just seen him over here. Yeah. You, you know, which is why you had to address it with Toya on the reunion. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, so I just think that uh, she finds herself in these situations. Yeah, it's OK to protect certain things, but you don't have to protect everything. You know, so it's OK to be authentic. It's OK to let pe- you've already been what on TV over 10 years. Ups and downs. Husband went to prison. You had your kids. Then somebody said, oh, you had a kid out of... You're not going to be discredited as a person. Shit happens. Everybody is human. You're entitled to a mistake. You should. You know, like right now, I'm yeah. trying to get out of a mistake. The, the stuff that hit, hit on TMZ, like, it's a mistake. Shit happens. We're well, all Well, that's human. the thing. Well, the thing is this. Obviously, what I loved about you and Phaedra working with you guys was the fact that this. You two came on the show and brought something so relatable, Right? Um, that people just don't talk about or they don't show. I know tons of women who are professionals, whether they're lawyers, doctors, whatever, and oftentimes their husband may have a past that includes incarceration because at the end of the day, black men are not set up in this country to win, right? We're just not. We're not. We're not. And I give Phaedra credit for looking at your soul and all of this, and saying to herself, you. you know what I'm saying? Like, I want to give this a chance despite me being this esteemed, accredited attorney. I'm going to follow my heart, break off my engagement, be with this man, and 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 choose that life. You know right. what I'm saying? So what we saw on the show to me was something relatable. But I, I am with you. I think the thing with Phaedra that I think us, us as the audience is like, well... Even watching Married to Medicine, and when she said, oh, I met Apollo in high school. And it's like, um, we know y'all have a, a, a cute little age difference. So I think it's stuff like that that bothers people because it's like, you ain't got to say all that. Like, we, you're a grown-ass woman. It was like Apollo was 14 and you were 18. Right. You know what I mean? So I, I definitely understand where you're coming from with that. Um, when it came to the Housewives, when y'all came on the show, it... I mean, eyeballs 
were on the two of you because it was you both are Scorpios which inherently means you're, you're private people, but you're on the biggest show on Bravo, is the number one show on Bravo, and then your life has changed drastically, and then it became a big story about your marriage, so much so that when Kenya Moore came on the show, was that something you were surprised that people really took this flirtiness would you what would you say about what you and Kenya's friendship were when you first met her on the show were you attracted to Kenya when you um, met her <laughs> um I thought that she was really a dope person like super cool when we first met I think it was with uh, Walter at the uh mm -hmm. the Grand Prix that was the very first time that I met her and, um, you know, I've, I've seen her around and stuff like that, but this is my first time, like, interacting. What I really liked about her, I thought that she was just had a good soul, a good person, uh, based on, like, just super funny. And I wasn't, like, in a flirty way. I was like, oh, I could vibe with that. Like, you know, she seemed like one of the, one of the authentic people that if we have to film with people and all this, like, it could be a jokey, like, a cool situation. And some people might have thought, like, it might be flirtatious or something like that. It started out as being, um, she's competitive as hell. Mm -hmm. It started off by that. That's what really was like, because I'm super competitive and I'm just like, OK. And it started out on the golf thing, a little putt putt thing and then some other things like and I was like, I can rock with this person, like but not in a sexual way or nothing like that. At first, the chemistry was good. Now, was she attractive? Yeah, very much so. You know, did you did you know who she was based on her being Miss USA? Yeah. Being a cup? OK. Yeah, I knew. Okay. But like I say, that didn't all come together as far as the knowledge until putting it. I've seen her out and about. And I've seen her like in the media and stuff like that, but I didn't put two and two together until after the fact. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, wow. OK, so I don't think I think, man. She made it clear that she was attracted to me. I mean, kind of, I mean, she kind of said it, you know, to when she say, says Apollo's kind of fine. Yeah. You felt that she was letting you know that she was attracted to you. Um. Yeah, I think so, but I wasn't using that as a as like a as a toy or a pawn, you know, to to put on the board and move it around. It was just like, okay, cool, you know. Uh, she verbalized it. I mean, I was like, I just kept it to myself. So she's a nice looking woman. I just kept it to myself. She verbalized it, but um, I just thought like she she had a good good personality, is what I, is what I liked about it. When did you realize your wife had a problem with your friendship with Kenya? Well, I realized it when I think I saw Kenya doing an interview or something. And I know that during that time, a lot of new people. So you, you learn a lot in this business. And uh, just backing up a little bit, while being on this show, you know, in hindsight, you there's a lot of things I'm sure you wish you would have did different. Mm -hmm. And or and then you learn from it when you get the opportunity again, you can implement those changes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> for me, the same thing. And I think we we skimmed over it a little bit um, prior to doing this interview about how, you know, just having that person, you, you know, I think when you come new into the celebrity or new into a platform, you need that person that can kind of coach you and guide you mm -hmm. and let you understand, OK, whether if it's product placement or whether it's, you know, working the proper contract or what to say, what not to say, you know. Like PR or whatever and then some people don't even have the revenue to afford things like that so then you don't want to find yourself in you know being misrepresented and so forth but I say it to say that I wish that you know we would have been better coached but see I think I think I was thinking that you know Phaedra the fact that she was uh, you know IP attorney during that time that she had this whole thing kind of mapped out mm -hmm. because I did go I signed on that dotted line based on the fact that we're signing as a family and we're doing this as a family. You're going to protect me and cultivate me and like vice versa. Right. And that wasn't the case. But that's a, that's later down the line, maybe in this interview. But um, when I saw Kenya do her interview, um, I thought she did well. And she's already been down that road before, but I thought she really did well and how she answered the questions and so forth. And I thought, you know, you know, I look sometimes at the shows and I say, oh, man, their makeup looks good. Or, you know, you learn these things, right? Okay, well, that man, that makeup don't look or the camera's not hitting that right. You know, you look at all mm -hmm. this stuff, right? So I thought, you know, everything was good. But it wasn't in like a flirtatious way. So I said, I sent her a message. And I said, uh, you did well. 
I said, I like your dress. You did well. And I think she responded back, thanks, blah, blah, blah. And Phaedra's seen that. I think, I, I, I believe she said, thank you, babe. Right? I don't remember, but okay, okay let's just say she did, right? Okay. Phaedra didn't take kind to that. But here it is. Is Now, I don't know if that was inappropriate. I mean, some people might say that was inappropriate. I didn't think it was inappropriate. I mean, hell, we're all on this platform together, right? We're all... How did Phaedra see it? Did she go through your phone? Yeah. She went through the phone. While you were asleep? No, we were right there. I, she I just a, snatched she, your phone? She, well, we were kind of like laying there and I was like, whatever. And she, um, I think something happened. I just know a shoe came flying by me <laughs> and the guy, and the shoe hit the, hit the wall. Yeah. <laughs> Like, she literally threw the shoe at me, threw a high heel at me. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, she, she seen it and threw the high heel. In, uh, in your I, face? Yeah, I had my back turned. So she's back there, and I'm so I sleep on the side of the bed that's closer to the wall. I don't know if you remember that house. Did you go to that I, house? Yes, I do. Yeah, of in, course. Uh, in, uh, yeah. Not the one in Buckhead, the one in... No, Smyrna. Yeah, Smyrna, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's like a little area. It goes straight to the bed when you come in. So I was sitting on that side and that whole open area is over there. So she threw the shoe and uh, I'm like, and then it goes down from there. And I'm just like, and then that's, I guess that fueled her to say, why are you, you know, doing this with my husband, da, 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 da. And then Kenya goes on the defense. Like, what are you talking about? It was, at first it was like, then it just gets a little more deeper and deeper, you know? It, it, it definitely got deeper so much so that obviously you know, when you guys were in Anguilla mm-hmm. and you threw Kenya in the pool. No, that's not how that happened. OK, that's not how I was. I, I didn't work that season. Yeah, so you, tell when, me when you run it back. Go ahead. Talk to me. I'm there chilling. Mm-hmm. All out chilling there. Greg, Nini, uh, rest in peace. Yes. Uh, they're over there. Uh, Phaedra's over there with them in the cabana. Portia and Cradell's over here, and I don't know, Peter's somewhere right there, and I'm there chilling, talking to the guys. She walks by, and she pushes me in the pool. Mm-hmm. That's what she did. And then Phaedra, you know, she makes her little side eye, and she does her little comments under her breath. I don't know what she's saying, right? But the cameras caught it. And so I get, oh, it's game on. Playtime. Let's go. Because y'all competitive. Yeah. So yeah. I get out the pool, and quite naturally, she's going in that water. So that's when I scooped her up and we jumped in the pool. So it wasn't like I just gonna come and pick this right. woman up and she she got a man there and I'm just gonna throw her in the water. No, I'm not that, you know, that brazen, but you know, I could be, but <laughs> <laughs> not like, that night. No, I wasn't gonna do that. <laughs> so that I mean, you know, so people, you know, they I don't I didn't see anything wrong with it, man. We were out having a good time, people were drinking, we're on vacation. What, what come on. But hey, it's for the TV. It's reality TV, right? Well, I, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that, you know, listen, it, it was evident that, and listen, I, I what was started was a healthy conversation amongst couples uh, was appropriate or inappropriate, so much so that I, again, correct me if I'm wrong, I do believe Kenya texts you, thank you, babe. And a lot of women said a single woman should never text a married man the word babe. And Kenya has apologized for that, right? Because, again, it's what you said. We, we, we're we learning how to navigate through this. Um, and I also think you just learn, like, I'm being competitive to this woman because, you know, she pushed me in the pool first. I'm going to get her back. And my wife is there, so I'm not trying to do anything, you know, because my wife is there. But then it became something crazy when conversations started to occur where you accuse Kenya of trying to suck your dick. <laughs> and that's when things became That's not funny, but crazy. I, I just was thinking about some other stuff, too. Did you tell Phaedra that because you wanted to just get her off your case and get the hill out of your head? Well... couple things I um if we're I didn't know that the show was going to get so convoluted and that it was going to be like an eye for an eye and everybody's going to do that because that's not because if you recall like the very first the first year right I was there but I wasn't really there True. Right. Yeah. So I didn't it wasn't until like maybe something happened at one of the reunions where it was like I think uh, Stephen was uh, he was back there and he was like said something to me uh, like something like 
you can talk or something like that. He was making a joke and was like, dude, why don't you express yourself? Mm -hmm. Like, well, how come you just always stay dormant? He was like, man, you did really well. Like, why aren't you speaking? And I was just like, well, you know, fuck it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. I, I, okay, I'll do better next time. Yes, sir. Okay. And so I started coming out of my shell a little more. And I didn't know that it was going to be to the point where everybody is going to just try to, you know, rip your soul out and always take, you know, and take everything for face value. And so when we were having, just like I say, if all of us went on vacation and we're friends per se, and we're all friends and we all dine together, we all go out together, we all do these things together. I wouldn't have a problem if, if, if my wife said babe to you or if, if you and her were, I got homeboys now, like shoot, me and Shireen has gotten into situations and I'm, some man might find it messed up, right? My boys will take, make sure that my wife is okay, give her the car to drive to come home and she drunk, take care of whatever, because we're friends. Mm -hmm. So I don't think nothing about it. And if she calls them babe or says, oh, you look good, babe, or, or whatever, I don't, I don't look at that as funny because, I mean, my relationship is a little different. My friends, the way we roll is different. I don't, I don't feel intimidated by anything like that. But now on the other side of it, when we're at that reunion, I wouldn't have said nothing. It's like this. I've let bygones be bygones. I let everything be chill. But when Kenya, she did open her mouth, and start saying stuff about, I've been texting her and all, oh, stop your man from texting me and da 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 da. Mm -hmm. Nah, you don't do that. Because there was, did anybody look at the text messages and see what was all in the text messages? There could have been a lot of things that was inappropriate in the messages. Okay? But once you put that out there, that's when I said, okay, all gloves are off. You know what? Okay. Since we're gonna put on, we, we're on this TV show and y'all wanna act stupid, let's act stupid. Since that's what you want to do, okay, I'm going to give it to you. First of all, you shouldn't have opened your mouth and said nothing about it. You shouldn't have said nothing. That You should have just left that out and y'all just argue about whatever y'all arguing about. But now you, it feel like Instant you- you. Yeah, you, you came from me. I'm sitting back here on the chair or wherever I was at, right there on the side. Dude, you should have never opened your mouth. Because I didn't open my mouth about you. I didn't say nothing. I didn't say, I've never said anything about you. You started it. Not me. That's how I felt about it. So you felt it was an eye for an eye. <laughs> going back to this competitiveness, like, you did this, I'm going to get at you. And is that the reason why you did lie about what she was trying to offer you? Yeah, that's, that's the reason. But also, it was also, a lot of it was calculated, too. Because this is why. If you look at the whole thing, okay, and people can... Everyone has an opinion. I feel like a lot of that ride, a lot of that ride was based on her notoriety. I think a lot of that came with the quorum between her and Phaedra, right? Oh, that was a beef, right? Me. Then after that, post that, it came the infidelity situation. That rode on for a whole season. I go to prison. So the part that, this is the other part. So how I turned around and, and, and I'm thinking about the longevity, about Phaedra, about the longevity of the show, about her still having a staple in the program. So the best thing I can do is it's a ripple effect and people don't see that. But you have to put you have to put those pieces out there and you have to look long term. So I looked at it when I made that statement and I did what I did because it was part of it was calculated. So when I do what I when I did what I did, I'm looking three, four seasons down the line like this can't just cut off like this. There's no way. So now by me going to prison and me telling everybody at Peter's restaurant at the bar one that this was all a lie, then it's like, what the fuck? Okay, it's a lie now. Oh, shit. So now once I go outside and I apologize to Kenya, now here you go, all this other shit. And then people don't really know if it's true or not true. So then here you go. Now everybody's going to talk about this, talk about that. And then I got to go. I'm going away. Her and Phaedra can figure it out down the mm -hmm. line, whatever, whatever. So you were trying to set up Phaedra to have staying power on the show. You knew you were going away. Because one thing about the night at Bar One, I remember talking to you and you felt like, I just want to clear the air before I go in. Yep. And you were like, Los, I want to say this to her. And Phaedra wasn't there that night. And, you know, you, you, you have the courage to you know, admit that to Kenya, who at the time she said she felt that she had like this scarlet letter 
on her that she was somebody who would offer fellatio to a married man. And I, 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 I believe what she said, I'm paraphrasing, but she, 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 she felt like the world thought she was that type of woman who would do that to a married man. Um, so kudos to you for obviously, you know, admitting to it. A lot of people did want to know if Phaedra put you up to that. No. You did that all on your own. All on my own. All on your own. 1,000%. And, and, she, and, and, and she, she, Phaedra believed it. Oh, yeah. She believed that part. Yeah. She believed it. Because, um, I mean, I just stood my, I just stood my ground. I stood my ground. You, you know, and, you know, I still felt how, I, I still felt how I felt about, you know, a man knows how far I think he can go with a woman, you know, given the, given the circumstance. Um, again, I don't think, and I'm not minimizing it. I'm not saying it didn't hurt her. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it might've hurt her emotionally. It didn't hurt her financially. Pedro, okay, no, yeah. either one, either one, okay. either one. It hurt both of them emotionally, but financially it didn't hurt. And for as their career, it didn't hurt. And you know, you, you're not going to be, who's looking at you interpersonally if whatever your preference is and whatever you choose to do as an individual, who's looking at you, whose opinion really matters? That's an interpersonal thing. So if someone's, the world is looking at you as being uh, a whoremonger or looking at you as being a person who offers married men fellatio, does, what are we talking about? Who says, who says that? Who's really saying that to you? Nobody. You're just going by what might be in the media you might go by what's being on the on the tweets at that time or the Instagram posts or whatever it is, the comments. But overall, I'm not saying I'm not negating the fact that the individual might have been hurt and mm -hmm. felt humiliated. I'm not saying that. But but if I'm a married man and you know that I'm married and you take a jab at me telling my wife on national TV, tell your husband to stop texting me or whatever, that looks bad. What does that look like I'm doing? Did you can did you consider that? Nobody considered that part. That's why I just did what I did and nipped it in the bud right then and there and just said, okay, let's go for this ride then. Let's go for this ride. Because you're already if if you're in a relationship and a person tells you that your significant other and our husband is texting me another person of interest, what are you gonna speculate? It ain't gonna be good. You're going to speculate the worst. What happened after you guys were going home after the reunion when she said, stop texting me? Because um, cause at that time, Phaedra was pregnant. Yeah. And and she obviously is dealing with the pregnancy, dealing, being emotional. Was there an argument on the way home after the reunion? Of like, the, are you, what What you mean you texting her? Stuff like that? Mm -hmm. No. That's the thing, man. Uh. I was about to say Shireen. No. So Phaedra and I, we don't, we really didn't argue like that. You know, there was no, there was, she says what she says. I say what I say. We more so would talk about certain things versus, no, there was some times that we would jump the gun, but we tried to work on that. Like, hey, before we just jump the gun, let's just ask the question, marinate, because she's an attorney too. You got to think like she tries to be calculated as well. So it's like, okay. She might throw something out there, ask the questions like, all right, cool. You want to talk about it now? You want to answer it later? Get your lie together. <laughs> you type thing, you know? Um, but <clears throat> no, we didn't really discuss it at all. I mean, think about it, we're dealing with other things. We got a newborn coming in. Mm -hmm. We got to figure out other stuff. So it's just like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand my ground. That's what it's going to be. That's what it was. Because remember, the text messages was back in, uh, I think it was whenever she was on the on the show when I said the shoot yeah. flying across the so but what would make her say that at the reunion? Why why would she throw me under the bus? She was mad at Phaedra for what? What was the what was the topic of conversation? I think maybe Phaedra said something about you want my man or something. I can't remember exactly mm -hmm. how that started, but mm -hmm. no, you had a listen. Um, that season, so season seven is when you got sentenced and you were on the way of going to jail. During that season is when you discovered that your wife, speaking of texting, was texting another man that was labeled Mr. Chocolate. 
How did you find that out? You did you go through her phone too? See, yes, I went through her phone. I went through her phone. Um, she used to safeguard her phone like it was like I don't know, man, kind of like they do down at the Federal Reserve, you know. And uh, this particular day, Aiden had or no Dylan, so one of them had a rash, and uh, you know. Back when, I don't think people was just touching the iPhone and turning the camera on from the screen. They mm -hmm. had to open the phone and go to the camera. Mm -hmm. I mean, not camera, the flashlight, not camera, the flashlight. So we were in the room back then. I don't think she wanted to turn the uh, lights on, so she used the flashlight to look. And it was like, um, I'll not forget this. So that morning we were going, I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, my children travel a lot and, you know, both parents have to be present for the passport and all that stuff. So I did all the docs, wanted to make sure that all their passports were up to date while I was gone, while I was gone. So we had an appointment to go get the passports to go send the applications and stuff in at the post office. So while we're getting ready to go, I see the phone with the light on. It means the phone's open. She goes to the other room. <clears throat> I take the phone. I go upstairs. I go in Dylan's room. I hide off in there. And I'm going through the phone. And I see all these messages with her and the guy flirting, her sending him these pictures and talking about, you know, I mean, it's all, they showed it all. It's all online, how she's had a couple of drinks and she's feeling a certain way and all just inappropriate shit. And how she can't wait for me to leave. So I guess that they can do whatever they're doing. I mean, hell, that's she texted, not me, you know? And I don't know if you remember, I did that interview uh, not too far from here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, uh, and then at that point, I came downstairs and I was like, I was pissed off. At the same time, there's an agenda. So I told her mom, I said a couple things to her mom. Her mom was in disbelief, said some things to her. We got in the car and handled our business. I didn't yell at her in the car, none of that stuff. I just said, you know what, we're going to go handle our shit. We'll deal with this like later. That's how you look at me. That's what you feel. Okay, cool. I don't expect, I really didn't have any expectations of me going to prison. You're going to hold it down. I'm, you're gonna, I, you know, I really didn't. I don't know what it feels like to know that in a matter of days, you're going to be sentenced to prison for five years and what that does to a person's mental, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why there's no judgment here, how you handled it, because I, I have no idea what that feels like. I don't know what it's like to know you get sentenced, but you're you're able to, you know, be free in the world. But in the back of your mind, you know, there's a, a end date of you being, you know, yeah. it's like you're inching. Let's just say, uh, imagine this is your road and that this box right here and this is the cliff. Right. So you're on this little train and it's inching. But you know it's, it's inevitable. You got to get to the end yeah. at some point, right? It's inching, and you're gonna fall off. But you know that, so yeah. you're just kind of just doing what you're doing, living every day, basically surviving. But internally, you're eating alive. Uh, and the problem is with that, my relationship and my wife at the time, there was nothing cultivated. There's no love. It was dark. It was like you turned your back on me. That's how I felt. So when I you made felt she turned your back. What? I'm gonna continue to feel that way. Why? Okay, let me tell you why. And that's how she thinks that Shireen, there was a lot of infidelity and there, this person cheated and Shireen was sleeping with a married man. That's not true. That's not true. Because what happened, I met a person through one of my good friends, my childhood friend, which was Shireen. I met her through Gordon. And during that time, it was, I met Shireen the second, that's when uh, I think Beyonce and Jay-Z started doing the Bud Fest in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. That's like a big thing they do. They shut the whole... Center City Down or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a big thing. And they got like 10 stages. It's real big. So I meet her through my friend on September 2nd of 2023. Just as friends being out. There was nothing about... You met her September 2nd... 2020... No, 2013. No, two, no sorry. 2013. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. glad. Glad you called me. Yeah. 2013, September 2nd. I was already... We were already going through stuff. Phaedra and I, it was already tumultuous. We were already trying to figure out, even before we went and bought the house, we were thinking about, hey, is this the right thing to do? But then she gets pregnant with Dylan. It's like, okay, maybe we should work this out, stick things in, let's just figure it out. So October 13th or October 12th, 
is when the Secret Service came. And that's when we knew, okay, this is what's about to happen. Don't know when, but at some point, you know, something's going to shake. I mean, I already knew that because once they, you know, did their little uh, warn and all that stuff. So when I first told Phaedra about it, she kind of just turned a blind eye to it. I'm like, this is serious. Oh, whatever. So then life continues to go on. So I have no one to talk to. So once that happened, I jump on a plane. I go see my guy in Philly. And I went and I saw Shireen. And we talked. And I, I, I laid on her couch. And it was the warmest feeling ever. The couch or her body? No, the couch. She was in the kitchen. Okay. She's, a, she's a chef. She cooks. So she was in the kitchen, but she was doing something. And we were just talking, and I just kind of shut down. I wasn't myself. And she was like, what's wrong? And I just broke down, and I was just telling her, like, I feel really bad because I'm about— It's not about what happened. Yes, I'm remorseful for that, but it was more so I'm about to leave my children. All I could think about is the relationship that I had with Aiden. Dylan was one, but I was, I'm about to leave my little boy, you know? I'm about to leave my little guy— and that's fucked up. He's going to, he needs me. Like, this is fucked up. And that's how I felt. And then she was just like, and I was like, man, it feels like my wife has just turned her back on me. I have no one to talk to. I don't want to throw my business out there in the streets. Okay. So at that point, um, it was really two people. It was her and Gordon for the most part that I was like, you know, confiding in. And so if I had people, you know, people like my guy, you know, Bun, he, we, he was supportive, but here it is, I'm laying on the sofa and she just looks at me and she holds my hand and says like, you know, just chill, stop, you know, d don't cry, it's going to be okay. I'm your friend. She says, I'm here for you. You need me, I'm here for you. Cool. So, all the time we would talk on the phone, all the time. It was just more so like, it was moral support. It's a lot of moral support. So then when the next episode came, I'm still talking to Phaedra, trying to. She's still not really trying to hear me out. I remember when, um, I think the next thing was like uh, an arraignment or something. She wasn't present. Then when it came time for, you know, uh, for the attorneys and stuff like that, you know, there was some, some pivotal moments. Like she was, a, she was present for that. You know, she was present for that financially. She helped out. Um, but here it is, collectively, we're, we're husband and wife, right? We, we're supposed to share, right? Everything's shared and, and so forth. Um, so I felt a certain way about that. Um, then as it started getting a little thicker, because we're getting we're, we're getting into it to 14 now. And there's a couple of chain of events that occurred with, you know, uh, legally mm -hmm. where she's not available. And at that point, I'm just like, man, you know what? This is not for me. This, this, you felt the marriage was yeah, over at, at that, that point. point. Like, so you've basically just. Your your image and your career is more important than what's going on right here. But remember, you known me and all of this before. Because remember, we got on the show together. It's not like you got on the show then brought me on the show. No, collectively we made this. Yeah, you had the the segue, you know, getting getting us on the show. But at the same time, it was collective effort. Mm -hmm. And I've been there from day one, day that the cameras rolled, even on the interview, day one at the office. So. Uh, I just felt like you just started to just really turn. And I really saw that. Let me tell you when I really, really seen that is, and I'm glad this happened, was when, and I think about like Shireen and my brother and everyone, um, he was a support too. Michael was a big support. Mm -hmm. But when you got a person who takes you to prison to self-surrender and that rides with you the whole time and it never waves every phone call, every visit, I mean, from Kentucky to Jersey, you know, being in Atlanta and then being away from their child at the time, that goes a long way, you know, because they have obligations, too. But then they're still committed as a friend. They're committed to their friend. And you got people out there that's mm -hmm. like that, you know. When I came back. Oh, and the matter of fact, and the same person that picks you up when it's time to go home, you know, so it goes a long way. But that day that I came to the house, the very last time that uh, that uh, I was filmed on Bravo, um, uh, prior to me coming back, there was a Caucasian guy at the house. I don't know if he's a PR. I don't know who he is. I don't know what someone's, you know, put in this gentleman's head. This guy thought 
that somehow either Phaedra made me or that house belonged to her, that I'm just, I don't know what he's conjured in his head, that I'm just some bum, that I don't have nothing. I don't know what he thought. But literally this man tells her, he tells me to get out of my house. He tells me to get out. Number one. Okay, that's definitely not going to happen, right? And then he tells her that this is not good for your career. You need to leave him. This is what this guy's saying right in my foyer right there at the house on Jet in Buckhead. So, you know, I got really aggressive, uh, not really aggressive, but like verbally, mm-hmm. verbal with the guy. I, I, stern, not aggressive, stern. I said, mm-hmm. listen, you know, it's probably, how about you get out of my house? How about you get out? You know, I don't, I don't need your services or whatever, whatever was said. And um, at that point, I, it just clicked. I said, you know what? Someone's been really putting things in your head. You know, because this doesn't really depict who you are, who I known you to be a long time ago. This is not the same person. But you it's said it's not the same loyal woman you met when you got out of jail, nope. and who recused herself from the case, who said to you, "I'll be with you, but this is gonna be serious." Dropped her engagement to be with you, stuck by you, to introduce you to this world. You felt that same woman wasn't having your back because. So you felt, listen, you felt disappointed, I'm assuming, and you felt abandoned. Abandoned and betrayed, man. I felt you felt like, abandoned and betrayed. Yeah. I mean, because, look, everything that I had, I shared. Everything. Everything I had, I shared. I put everything that I could possibly do into whatever. Um, and then here it is. We, we fall on some hard times, and you just, pew, shoot the other way. That's not how, That's not what love is about. That's not what friendship is about. You don't just run the opposite direction just because the po- man, do you know I'm and we used to talk about things that's relatable do you know what I mean things have happened to people it seems like TV tears people apart when it shouldn't you're supposed to be strong enough to know that hey look we're going through some shit right now we need to fight through it let's figure it out I'm here there's no way that I can't see my kids for five something years but the fact that Bravo says we're gonna pay you to go up to the jail that's the only time I get to see my kids because of you was compensated financially? That's wild, man. That's wild. So when you... Okay, so going back a little bit, when you saw those text messages between Phaedra and Mitchell Chocolate, were you... Did you already meet Shireen or did you meet her after that? Um, I think... I think I already met her. I think so. Because the chocolate thing... That, so yeah, because... The chocolate thing came probably, I want to say after the new year, going Mm -hmm. into 14. I think so. So was it sort of like you two were mentally checked out of the the marriage? She's supposed, you know, she's texting another man. You're sleeping on another woman's couch. No, I wasn't sleeping on the couch. Not laying on the couch, sorry, laying on the couch. No, I laid on the couch. You laid on the couch, okay. Um... (laughs) So would, would it be fair to say that you two were mentally checked out around the same time for, for whatever reason? Hey, I think if people are mentally checked out, it should be a discussion. Did, did Phaedra know that that was your girlfriend? It don't matter because we're not even talking. She's not coming to see me. She's not supportive. I'm pay for my own phone calls to call my kids. You don't put money on my books. She don't send me a dime in jail. So what does it matter? All I asked her was one thing. I said, don't, not because we're not getting a divorce. Let's get this clear for everybody. The divorce was, was, was imminent. Okay. It was don't get a divorce while I'm in prison. Why? Because I want to sit down with our kids and let them know that we're, we're at an impasse. Both parents love them equally. This is just what people go through, like just cultivating the children so they're not exposed to just, oh, your mom and dad's not together no more and whatever's in the media. Let's just ease them into what's going on, a better understanding. Because the way it is nowadays, husband and wives, they just break up and the kids are just left out there in the, in the, in the cold. They have no understanding. The, 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 the parents are selfish. All I cared about is just allowing my children to see it from a different perspective. Look. You got two houses now. Hey, you got, you know, I'm going to find somebody. She's going to find somebody. This happens in life. 
not just leave it up to their own understanding, which that's what happened. And so Aiden and I, when I first came home, oh man, we, we just butt heads. He gave it to me. Like he put it on me thick, you know, uh, we was at Sky Zone and he just basically just let me have it. And then. But just like you weren't there from, cause he's. Mm. Oh man, he just had his own perception. You abandoned me and my mom. Mm. You wasn't there for me. How could you do this? How did you leave us like that? Why, you know, that wasn't the plan, buddy. You you put me in a different, you put me in a whole nother situation. If you would have been a little supportive, how many times did you tell my son or my sons that I love them or daddy, daddy loves you guys and you know he'll be home soon or this that? How many times did you I guarantee you probably none? Probably none. But these things help, they go a long ways, you know. So when I say that, you know, uh checked out and all that stuff, I just could kind of see a lot of things coming beforehand but when you you show your true colors your hand is exposed so regardless of what I did once I went away you were showing me already that you don't care and you know the, the thing about it was once I left uh, Kentucky I asked her I said hey all I want to do is see my kids that's it I'll pay for the flight. I'll have my brother to fly with him. I'll, I'll pay for a hotel. I'll pay for you to come. Whatever I needed to do, I needed you guys. I needed to see my kids. Because what that does, it gives me strength. It allows me to still keep fighting, to keep going. Mm -hmm. You know, That's all I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get it. So I had to find it from somewhere else. I had to dig from within and keep asking God just to like allow me to prevail and, and just give me that strength to keep going on. So then that's why I would call. We would have, you know, I would always, I would always write, send them cards. I would put chocolate in the cards and send it to them. I would do whatever I could just to let them know that I loved them. And if my mom would get them, then at least she would say, always try to tell them, hey, you know, your daddy loves you, blah, 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 blah. That's all. But um, once I saw that, you know, uh, it was pretty much she didn't care. So I was like, all right, cool. Let's move on. You have on. to move on. Let's move on. So you moved on. One of the things that happened that season two was you had your bikes and some belongings in Candy and Ta's garage. Mm -hmm. um, and then Phaedra found out. And season two? No, no, no. Season nine. Season nine. Okay. Season nine, it was uncovered okay. that your some of your belongings were in the garage. And that became a bone of contention between Phaedra and Candy um, because Ta felt like you know, he's my boy. I'm going to look out for him. But then you and Todd had a falling out um, during this soon thereafter. What happened with this falling out that you and Todd had to the point you two almost got into a physical fight at a at a club? Um. OK, this is the I tried to speak on this topic before. Right. With. um. With, I think. Uh, somebody. It's on another another uh, podcast. This was uh, in 2019. And for everybody out there, again, you know, hopefully, you know, Candy and Todd, someone can listen and understand where I'm coming from. Okay, we'll start with this back end and go back, go to the front. As a friend, if you give me your watch to hold, that expensive Rolex that you have, right? Well, dang, Apollo, don't look... Don't call me out now. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> and you tell me, and you tell me to hold your watch for you. Uh huh. And you're gonna come back and get it later on. And as a friend, I take your watch. Mm hmm. And in the duration of you being gone, to come back and get your belongings that belong to you, and I agree to hold your watch. We're, we're on face level now. Really simplistic. Nobody should get lost in this conversation. And I misappropriate your things, whether someone steals it, whether I lose it, whether I'm moving and I break it, whatever happens. If I misappropriate your stuff, your watch, and you return to get your stuff and it's not there, out of respect for you as a person, I owe you an explanation mm -hmm. yeah. as to what happened. What happened? Yeah. Here we go. I found out about my stuff being misappropriated on TV sitting in jail. Okay? I'm in jail watching it on TV. And hence, I get calls from my attorney, not a call, email from my attorney, because you got like the core link system there, mm -hmm. saying you need to call me ASAP. 
And I find out about all this, that now there's a, there's a seizure, uh, that I lied on my deposition on my, because my case was too, it was uh, the... It was the criminal side, and then it was a forfeiture, asset forfeiture and all that stuff. So all this starts unraveling. I'm like, what the fuck? What's going on? Okay, when I came home, Todd and I spoke on the phone. Todd would put money on my books at times, okay? Todd would speak to my brother. Todd would, I think, email me. Uh, sometimes when he's not busy, I would get this, his emails. Nothing, nothing about that. When I came home, there was nothing about what happened. Hey, man, let me pull you to the side, man. This is what happened. I just want to save my face or my wife. Whatever, mm -hmm. whatever happened, you never told me. Okay, you left it up for speculation. And speculation can drive a motherfucker crazy. So People when you like, came home, was your stuff damaged or was it, it was just gone. not there? It, it was, was gone. gone. Yeah, the feds took it. The feds, the feds went to Ken and Todd's house and took the belongings. Right, now, now we're going to go to the front. Okay. That's my stand on it. You at least owe me... The heads I up. never asked you for no money. I don't ask you to replace it. I didn't ask for none of that. Never have I. I don't care about it. It's gone. Okay? Yeah, I could be one of those people that's like, oh, you owe me some money. I don't care. It's not about the money. It's about the principle of saying, hey, man, you gave me your stuff to hold, and somehow down the line, that shit ain't there when you return. It's not. That's just, it's black and white. It's not there. Whatever happened in between there, I still deserve... I don't need to ask Phaedra what happened. I didn't give it to Phaedra. I gave it to you and your wife. That's it. What happened? Now, whether I agree or don't agree, at least out of respect for an individual, you let them know what happened. This dude, I get your watch and you come back to get your watch and I just, I don't hear you. What? I don't, I'm not even re replying to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And you might be a little, what does that do? That's going to fuel a little, mm -hmm a little animosity, right? It's mm -hmm. going to make you feel a certain way. It's going to make you feel like you're chumped off, like I just really disrespected you. So that's on one token. You got to take all that into consideration. So on the front end, it was more so like, look, I have these things off the record. I go over there because we were friends, I considered. So I met Todd under these other circumstances. I met Todd through his birthday party. There were some things that transpired. I won't even get into all that. He knows the real. I was a genuine person. He was supposed to be a genuine person. I met Candy a while back. She seemed to be really cool. I thought everybody was cool. We were all good. You have this big house. You have multiple, you have a lot of space. Mm -hmm. You're not utilizing that stuff right now. This is my thought. I said, hey, look, um, they have another friend, uh, Greg. Shout out to Greg. Greg's a real one. Definitely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. But, um, when I went over there, I just said, hey, look, you at the house? Like, yeah, I'm at the house. I pull up, talk to him. Candy's inside getting her makeup done or whatever. I said, yo, listen, I need you to run this by Candy, but this is what's going on with me. I mentioned to him about, I think I mentioned the whole uh, Mr. Chocolate situation to him. And he was like, damn, oh, you for real? Da, da, da. And then he, I was like, look, can you go get Candy? He's like, well, she's doing a makeup or whatever. I said, I don't think she'd mind. Like, can you tell her to come out? Cool. Excuse me, that little side door right there when you go up their, their driveway, she comes out that little side door right there. I say, yo, what's up? I was like, look, man, this is what's going on. I want to talk to y'all together and let you know, you know, I appreciate everything y'all have done for me over the years. You know, it's been a good one, but this is my first time letting them people know. It hasn't even hit yet that the Secret Service came and I could potentially be going away. Mm -hmm. Okay? Nobody knows, but me, my family, Shireen and them and my attorney. I haven't even told Bravo nothing yet. So I go to him. I said, look, this what's going on. Can I put my stuff over here? How do y'all feel about that? Well, when are you coming back? I said, well, I don't know. It could be, you know, five, six years. I'm not sure. Okay, cool. No problem. I said, look, just hold my stuff down. Here goes, I'm going to bring it up. When are you going to bring it? I said, I'll bring it in a couple of days. Okay, just let us know. It's safe here. You know, it's cool with us. No problem. Took my stuff over there, left the keys, left my stuff. Here you go. Well, it's supposed to be quiet as kept. Candy shouldn't go on Andy Cohen talking about my stuff's being in their garage. This is a federal case, man. This potentially almost cost me five more years for perjury. 
Mm. Lying under oath. Okay? It's not a joke. I didn't... It might seem like a good storyline, but 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 you're dealing with someone's freedom. So then I take that into consideration, too. I get it. I, I give you a pass, you know, because you don't really understand the judicial system and you don't know how these things work. And it seems like it's all fun and games, you right, because you guys are on the outside. But I'm literally in federal custody and I'm dealing with a situation here. And I came because I came to you because I felt like I trusted you. So you see how this is going now. You see where where here it is. I'm in the middle. And why I feel the way I feel. And everybody has a story. We're not got to the point of how did or why did. We haven't got to that part yet about the misappropriation. Mm -hmm. It's still about the emotional and, mm -hmm. and what's black and white. So here at that point, I leave my stuff there. And then, you know, Candy does her interview with Andy Cohen. You know, speaking about our relationship and how maybe it slipped out. I don't know. Guess what? But it's out there. Okay. Then next thing you know, people are filming my stuff at their house. Why would you think, because I'm hot at the time, the storyline's hot, me going to prison, all that's hot, it's, it's, it's popping. It's everywhere. That was, a, that was a big moment for Bravo at the time on that show. What would make you think that it's okay to do, a, what's the, to do an episode about my stuff in your garage? What's the point? And you're watching this while you're in prison. Yeah. On television. I'm watching this while I'm in prison. And you're just like. Yes. Got it. Yes. All hell's about to break loose now. Yeah. Yep. All hell's about to break loose. So. So at that point, there was already. So this is the thing. Um, no explanation, nothing. So Todd was telling me, and you mentioned about like altercation, all this stuff, right? So mm -hmm. I did an interview and basically that was taken out of context too. You know, we it was COVID, you know, everybody's at their house drinking, having a good time, whatever, you just making the best of it. So me and Peter were doing an interview and it was more so like, well, how's your relationship with uh, Candy and Todd? Just go look at the interview. The first thing that I said, I always give them their props. I said, I'm, I, I appreciate them as people. I still say it to this day. I, you know, I commend them on all their accolades and their achievements. I'm glad that, you know, I'm very happy for their success and everything. I'll continue to say that. That never changes, right? But I said, that's what I said. I said, oh, but, okay, feds, come on over and take Apollo's stuff. It's right here in my garage. Y'all mm -hmm. can have it. You know, I made that joke, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, and then it kind of stemmed off. And I think it was like, what? I said, yeah, they, they fucking just told the police where my stuff was at, right? Not, not discrediting the fact that did Phaedra put the segue and put it all out there? Phaedra never came out her mouth. This is what I could say. You could say it was Fa Phaedra, 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 right? Did it. Let's just say. The stuff's at your house. Phaedra wasn't filming with you. Mm -hmm. Phaedra wasn't at your house filming with you. Okay, that wasn't Phaedra's storyline. Mm -hmm. But if you're saying that no one made you film that episode, let's just say she we don't know. You can say all day long that part of this was because, you know, Phaedra put it out there and they were talking about it and this, that and the third. Talk is talk. If you would have never filmed it, per se, we don't know what the outcome could have been. If you're verbalizing it on TV that my stuff is at your house or whatever. We could just look at the timelines. But let's just say, let's just say that Phaedra and Candy were talking about it and they were filming them just talking about having lunch or something, mm -hmm. right? That's one thing. But the feds didn't come to their house based on a conversation. The feds came to the house based on actually evidence showing that these items were there. That's how they came to the house. You, you see, there's a difference here. Mm -hmm. And then if you wouldn't have filmed that over here, the mere conversation that y'all had at dinner, per se, we don't know what would have happened. But both things happened. The conversation, well, the Andy Cohen situation, perhaps the conversation that they're saying happened uh, with Candy and uh, Phaedra. And then here it is, the filming of the items. So a lot of shit is in the mix here. That here it is. I'm, I'm, but I'm, I'm in prison being puppeted. I'm the puppet, right? And someone's just pulling my strings, right? 
So when I made that statement, it was more so like, dude, like have a little bit of respect for me, man. Like, like talk to me about it. What, what happened? Because I need answers too. Was it you guys? I get it. Did you make a mistake? You didn't understand the magnitude of what was going on. I get it. Cool. Or was it Phaedra? Well, that's a whole nother situation because that's real slimy. That's real snakish. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's a little, that's something else I need to figure out now. Is this, this what's really going on? You know? So there's so many things and so many layers that need to be peeled back that I never got answers to. So all I was seeking was closure. And people took me seeking closure as trying to slander somebody or put someone under the bus. And that wasn't the case. And then so when we, when I seen the, seen Todd out and the little situation happened, it was more so like, dude, are you going to talk to me? So, so y'all y'all allow and you see each other. Do you go up to him first? He comes up to you. No, I go up to him, but not in any type of, you know, I wasn't being aggressive or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I just went up to him and was like, first he had like his entourage there and I couldn't really get to. Finally, man, I walk up to him. He's at the bar. And uh, I'm like, look, man, when are we going to talk? When are we going to sit down like men and talk? And then it just kind of goes left field. And the next thing you know, he says something to Peter. And then, you know, Peter says something to him. And then Peter has my back and saying, you know, he's a grown man. I'm going to ride with him, a ride with Apollo. He's, he's entitled to say whatever he wants to say. He feels a certain way. And however he feels, he's entitled to feel that way, right? So it took, it was a while, man. Then I seen, uh, most recently, it was a couple months back, um, maybe right after the new year, um, or, no, sorry. Maybe right before the new year, right after Christmas, somewhere in that time, I see Todd at uh, one of the establishments here in Atlanta. And um, I didn't know he was there. So I was in one spot. He comes, I'm going to the restroom. He's running upstairs. How about him and Peter? Something was going on downstairs. Mm. But come to find out, they were trying to squash everything, let bygones be bygones. They agreed to put it behind them. Todd sees me. And he's like, look, man, come downstairs. Let's all talk. By that time, Peter was gone. Well, he really wasn't gone. He went upstairs to the third floor. Todd said they were, they were getting ready to close. The owner was there. I was like, look, we're just going to stay in here and chill and talk for a minute. So we talked. Todd somewhat understood where I was coming from. He was saying that, you know, he felt like it was coming from a different direction uh, and then he was just saying that you, he was a little apologetic that he wished that, um, he would have had better devised a plan for when I came home. He wished that he would have been in a position to better assist me. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily a financial position, but at least, you know, put different things in motion or whatnot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he just said that, you know, as a friend, he said he genuinely was my friend and, you know, the friendship, you know, it's, it's sad that it happened the way it happened. Um, and again, I was just trying to conveyed him but we were drinking at the same time and I said listen I don't have no problem with you I have no problem with you I never had a problem with you I have a problem with the circumstances with how everything well I did have a problem with you but it was more so based on the circumstances and how everything unfolded then uh, I saw him again after that we chilled party together we spoke on the phone we were supposed to get together I think um, there was some premiere or something happened and we were supposed to get together we didn't I missed that and then I saw him the f a couple weeks later, and it was uh, his daughter. They were all out. We were at the same spot, and uh, we partied, had good. a good time. So you guys are good. Yeah, we're good. We don't Perfect. chill. We don't chill or talk, you know, regularly like we should probably should try to. But still, there's no closure. I don't. But I, at this point, I'm just like, you know what? Fuck it. You know, at this point, if that's how it's gonna be, I don't really know. But the meat of it is, like I said, you just wanted to know what, what happened. Man, and funny. and even giving a heads up. Um, so you've been in the news lately. Um, there's been some text messages released. Obviously, you and Shireen are married. Um, there were text messages revealed that you are allegedly or were allegedly cheating on your wife with another woman. Some text messages reveal some things of I love you. I'm on my way to see you. Um, this woman's talking about the perfume she's wearing. Um, there's a ring camera, Apollo, of you at this woman's house. Are you cheating on Shireen? Are you... It looks bad. It looks really bad. Is that you in the video? Yeah, that's me in the video. 
it looks really bad. Well, first I want to say, you know, I'm very apologetic. Um, I'm very um, remorseful for what happened and the pain that I've caused, you know, my family or the humility more so that I've caused my family and that I caused Shireen. I know she's heartbroken, devastated by, you know, what's happened. Um, she's definitely scarred. Um, I know that. But again, it's like, uh, and just being candid, you know, uh, every relationship goes through things, you know, people go through things from an emotional standpoint. I just feel like, um, there's no excuse. I'm not making an excuse for what I did. What I did was wrong. Allowing another woman that opportunity to, I didn't cheat. Number one, you didn't have sex. No, with I didn't the have woman. sex with the woman. No, because okay. some people consider emotional ties, cheating. You know, being emotional with someone. Some women have said, I prefer you to be, to sleep with a woman rather than telling her I love her or you're emotionally invested, you know. So I get that. You know, it was it was wrong. So I'm not trying to, you know, make light of any of it. But, no, I wasn't sleeping with the female. We never slept together. Um, it was like this. Um, I was going through a little situation on the home front. You know, maybe I could have did a better, based on my experience and what's going on, I probably, we both probably could have did a better job at or me, per se, do a better job at letting Shireen know, like, look, this is how I feel. This is what's going on. I think that right now where I'm at in my life, we might need to cultivate something here because, uh, you know, I'm feeling a different, a certain way. So me and this individual, uh, we met probably like a year and a half ago, like met for the first time, but we didn't exchange information or nothing like that. It wasn't until maybe June of 23 or July of 23, that we uh, met again, exchanged phone numbers that time, and we've been talking ever since, right? So um, there was a situation that arose um, where Shireen saw the messages in my phone. Not those messages, but like messages. She was mad. It's like, oh, you're dealing with this female? I'm like, no, I'm not really dealing with her like that. You know, cool. We try to cut it off. Again, that was kind of easier said than done. We kept talking, kept doing flirting thing, kept talking. It was like, listen, I'm. she knows I'm married. She's dealing with her situation. It was like, okay. But we just kept talking, really confiding in each other. We got really close. You know, then it came to like, you might tell your friends you love them or you tell your friends you miss them. There was things in those messages that are not true. Like the perfume, I never bought her any perfume for no Christmas. I didn't do that. Um, when I said something about the baby, the baby, if you look at the, under the text message, she says, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Oh, it's gonna, then she said it's going to be a great 24. I said, yes, yeah, it's going to be great. You're going to have a baby. LOL. And I said, I can see your face right now. I'm dying laughing because mm -hmm. she doesn't want any more kids and talks about how sometimes, you know, you want to wait till you have children and have everything in place, blah, blah, blah. I was just a joke. But it says that. It says, LOL, I can see your face right now. I'm dying laughing. This is me saying that or whatever. Um, Again, not making light of it. How did it get leaked in the oh, first place? I'm getting place? to that point. I'm oh, I'm to sorry. That. Yeah. So I'm, yeah, I'm getting. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, again, you know, uh, confiding in one another, and so it got to the point where it was like, hey, you want to come over? So yeah, sure. I came over. When I came over, if you look in the video, there's no hugs or kisses in the video. It's me moving her out the way I sit on the thing. Now, that's inappropriate. You shouldn't be at another woman's house married. I have my feet up on the so on the coffee table or the sofa as if I'm comfortable. She puts her head in my lap. Not cool. Let's just say outside of that, let's just say if we were friends and there was no text messages, are friends not allowed to interact like that? Not making excuses, but I'm just saying. I know, but it sounds like you love a comfy couch. Oh, from yes, from <laughs> that's, 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 that's no, but it's uh, it's definitely was inappropriate. Um, mm -hmm. so so now, uh, I feel like I got caught up in a crossfire because she gets back with um her guy, she's deal now. Mind you, we decided at the last text message that you see, we decided to cut it off and say, listen, let's just quit, okay. You got your situation going on. I need to work on my situation. We blocked each other. She blocked me. I blocked her. There's no way we can contact each other. That was the that was the plan. This is like a little bit in January. Mm -hmm. um, so come to find out, her guy suspects her dealing with someone else. He takes her phone. He knows her code. Listen, he takes her phone. This is another person taking the phone, right? He takes her phone. It sounds weird. But when he takes her phone, he, he's gone for 24 hours. And 
He goes through the phone and sees the messages between her and I. He confronts her about dealing with a married man. And she says, no, I'm not dealing with him. We're just friends. So when I said, like, I'm, on, I'm coming over, I'm at the door or something, mm -hmm. he takes those dates and cuts in the ring camera and goes through her ring camera because he has her phone. And then he recorded all that stuff and he found a media outlet and he leaked it to the media. That's how it got out there. It wasn't her. She didn't leak it. And how I found this out, you know how you have... Um, so if you have another um, media outlet that wants to run a story or so forth, just being in this business, some of these people are kind of respectful. They yeah, might reach they'll, out. They'll give you a heads up. Yeah, yeah. they'll give you a heads up. Yeah. So I got a heads up by one of them. And I was just like, well, what, well we're going to see if this is, uh, what's the validity behind all this? Well, come to find out when the guy leaked the thing, they actually did a small interview with the guy based on like, well, how did you get this? You know, where did this come he from? He did an interview? Well, not necessarily interview. I guess they 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 took notes as to how. Oh, like you said, to 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 see the validity of yeah, these. Exactly. Okay, I got it. So he and he's telling them. Got it. Yeah, he basically said, you know that. You know, he took her phone. So guys do this now. Man, it's some real girly stuff, man. That these men do, man. It's wild. That's wild. That's wild. And how is Shireen today? She's not well. She's Are not you two still together? Yeah, we're still together. Living um, together? Yeah, we still live together. It's a little, it's rough. Not a little rough. It's rough. It's rough. Yeah, it's rough. Um, but how do you feel when people say, whatever, Shireen, you, you, that's how you got them. That's how you're going to lose them. But that's not true. A lot of people feel like, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you know, because people don't know the story. They think that just because, okay, so if, for example, if you're married on paper, and you're going to get a divorce, you could be with a situation like, let's just take, you know, Shireen's sister. For, matter of fact, Shireen was married, right? She didn't finalize her divorce until maybe 2016, 2015. Shit happens, mm. right? Some people just don't want to sign or some people are, are indecisive or whatever, right? But it wasn't finalized until later. You... You don't realize, well, people don't realize that, you know, Phaedra and I continue to stay together, right? But no one broke up a happy home. The home wasn't happy. Right. Okay? It was already on the, on the outs. And if you get to that point where there's like an impasse and you just decided to go your separate way, it's, it's your business. But see, you always got the outside speculation. Everyone's always going to speculate and come up with their own narrative. And what that's for, that's not healthy. What they're coming up with a narrative is to create, again, a storyline, to continue to create drama and to impose, uh, inflict more uh, turmoil on mm. an individual. Because these women read that stuff, you know, because yeah. she, she mentioned it before because I know she reads it. You know, it's not healthy. I don't get into that. I don't like doing that. And as you get into this business, the deeper you get into the business, you realize that that's not cultivating health. A, a healthy environment for yourself it's not it, that's not giving you that so i just stay out of that realm of it okay good the stories ran i see it i was there i lived it cool clearly shireen should know that based on our relationship from the from the beginning you know where i was at in my headspace now women are very emotional and they say the damn damnedest things man i don't know where they, they i don't know where who teaches them these things that they say but man this shit cuts and you, when you look at the pattern, it's like like you mentioned, okay, the couch thing, right? Even mm -hmm. though we're joking about it, but yeah, there's some similarities there. But it's not, I'm not saying like, oh, I'm not seeking to go run to this woman. I'm not going right. to, let's say, God forbid, if, uh, if Shireen and I get a divorce, God forbid, I'm not going to go be with that woman. Me and this woman, when I tell you we stop talking and we, we like, we stop talking. There's no thing. There's, we're not, we don't have a thing, you know, and, but. Shireen, in her mind, she feels like it's a thing. And all the time, it's going to revert back to, you did this to me, you did that to me, you know? And I, I'm wrong for that. Um, but it, it is what it is. It, it happened, and like, what do you do? You, you either move forward, or it's really simple. You can't continue to, we can't continue to um, degrade one another, right? Demoralize each other, you know, verbally, verbal abuse. abuse. Um, you're going to, two things on the table. There's a line in the middle. You got divorce papers, or we're going to get our act together. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very simple. You don't want to, how are you going to work on getting your act together? But then you keep throwing all these things out here that are, you know, demeaning. No one wants to be demeaned. Nobody wants to be emasculated. None of that stuff. You know, during these times you need support or you need to figure out like how to make better, 
you know? Yeah. The speculation is terrible. And, you know, that's not my first time having little little situations happen. So that's what makes it even bad. I mean, that's the first time it's been publicized. But, you know, I've had little little snippets, little things that's happened in my relationship with Shireen that's not not the best. Right, which is why now, because it's so public, she's oh, yeah. dealing with it. Differently, yeah. On a different level. Well, look, I appreciate you, Apollo. You know, you are a very private person now. Your business in development and real estate is booming. You're, you're really doing doing well. Thank you. And listen, for me, it goes to show you that, listen, you are a man who has owned up to his mistakes, but it doesn't define you as a person. And the beauty of you is you're able to walk, walk away from a situation, serve your time, and and not make that the end of your story. Right. You know what I'm saying? So kudos to you for that. Thank you. And, and for showing people that that doesn't mean you have to stay in that position. Because you know there's a lot of people who come home. They It's hard to be embraced. Right. By the workforce and society. Right. And obviously you have a lot of people supporting you, me being one of them. Right. Who really wants to see you do well. And you are doing well. Thank you. I mean, you have a little bit of sneakers, my brother. You want to call out my Rolex, I'm going to call out your sneakers. <laughs> you know, so you, you, you're doing very well for yourself. And look. We we love you. Thank you. You know, love we want to see you back on TV. It was great seeing you, the Marriage to Medicine reunion. We want to see I more was, of you. I was shining. I was you, were, you were great. You <laughs> All the girls were starstruck like, yeah, I saw that, this yeah. is the man, the myth, the legend, Apollo. Like, right. all, the married women was like, ah, Apollo. <laughs> so we want to see you back on TV. My last question, would you ever do reality TV again? Most definitely. I would do TV in all aspects. I mean, I've had an opportunity to understand the business, examine the business, uh, the do's and don'ts, the ups and downs, uh, what it comes with, what it entails, you know. So, um, yeah, it's a great platform. It's a great opportunity. And I think people I think people should do it. I think they should educate themselves and take the educated route with it. And then you're going to have a better experience. It's almost like, to be honest, like uh, maybe... A year before I went to prison, I really, because at first I was like, it's like a wave. Like if you're in the ocean, there's no way you're going to be able to beat that thing. Okay. It's either you need to ride with it. Just get on your little board and, and go out there and wait for the wave to come and just push you on it. Mm -hmm. So I started doing that, taking that approach. And man, I really enjoyed it. Like the last couple of years I was on TV, I really had a great time. Like I wasn't really, it was great. You get what do you go act a fool, go eat, <laughs> not get, act a fool. Get your get your hair done, you know. Get your get go get your hair cut, <laughs> you know. Put your nice clothes on, put your <laughs> put your drip on, and go act idiot and go and go get paid. I, I, I had a great time. Well, good. Well, yeah. well, well, do more of it. Yeah, I had a do great more time. of it. We miss you on TV, and thanks for the service, brother. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate you, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Oh. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Raindrops, now I hope you enjoyed that video. And if you did, that means you should love these suggested videos right here. So make sure you click on one of these and watch it. And don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel.